go ahead and get started today. Uh, I would just like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jessica Duke. Um, she will be speaking about asymptomatic bacteria, and she is an expert in this subject, given her research project this year is on this topic, and then she's done a lot of research for that, as well as this presentation. Um, so she'll be presenting symptom-free, let it be, management of asymptomatic bacteria. All right. Well, thank you, Kyle, for that introduction. I'm not sure if I would call myself quite an expert yet, but <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So I have nothing to disclose in regards to this presentation. Some objectives I would like for you to take away from our talk today is to be able to differentiate between asymptomatic bacteria or ASB and urinary tract infection. We're also going to employ strategies for appropriate urinalysis or UA ordering and interpretation. And we're going to summarize the IDSA recommendations for the management of ASB. So what is ASB? Simply put, this is just the presence of bacteria from a properly collected urine culture in patients that are not presenting with acute urinary symptoms. This is fairly common in clinical practice and its incidence can increase with age in addition to some patient specific characteristics as well that may have higher rates of ASB. However, most patients do not go on to develop symptomatic infection and that's important to keep in mind. And in fact, what we'll see in this presentation is that ASB may actually have a protective mechanism um, from preventing uh, recurrent UTIs in the future. And so this should not be treated in the vast majority of patients because the risk of antibiotic use far outweighs its benefits. So I mentioned this is pretty common. Well, how common exactly? Um, as you can see, or as I mentioned, it's common to find bacteria in the urine in patients without symptoms, particularly residents of long-term care facilities, patients on dialysis, Elderly patients are examples where we see high rates of ASB. Additionally, bacteria is almost always present in patients with chronic and dwelling catheters. So we should never be getting UAs and cultures on these patients when they are not presenting with symptoms. And this is due to the fact anytime we introduce any sort of foreign matter into the body, this provides bacteria with a great medium for growth and to form biofilms. So why does this occur? Well, we tend to think of this more commonly in females, but it can certainly happen in males as well. But females particularly um, are at risk for this given the shorter distance of their urethra. Um, and so that provides bacteria with a shorter distance to travel to the bladder. But commonly this is transient and can be cleared um, through urination. Uh, but particularly in, in our elderly patients, uh, another risk factor for this can be incomplete bladder emptying that we can see in patients with um, BPH, for example. Um, but as I mentioned, it is benign and should not be treated. So I mentioned a brief definition of what ASB is, but there are set in stone criteria that the IDSA recognizes as true bacteria. Um, and so this can differ between a midstream clean catch specimen versus patients that have a catheter present. In our midstream catch, we typically think of a um, threshold of 100,000 colony forming units to represent true bacteria. And then in our catheterized specimens, even though 100,000 colony, colony forming units seems to be the most accurate, lower colony counts can in fact represent true bacteria, but the clinical significance of this has not been evaluated. I just wanna note here that technically in women, they recommend two consecutive urine specimens to diagnose true bacteria. However, we know in practice that this is, in the hospital setting at least, this is not clinically relevant as we are not gonna be getting multiple urine samples on patients. So I mentioned ASB occurs when patients do not have signs and symptoms of UTI. What exactly are these signs and symptoms? So 
These may differ depending on if patients presents with a lower cystitis versus pyelonephritis. So as you can see, some signs of acute cystitis can be dysuria. This tends to be the most sensitive and what patients tend to complain of most frequently. So painful urination. Additionally, they may have an increase in urinary frequency or urgency, but it's important to keep in mind that when a patient is presenting this with this, we really want to define if this is an acute uh, frequency or urgency, or if this is something that the patient struggles with as ba at baseline, because other things can definitely cause this as well. And then additionally, suprapubic pain may also be present. When we think of pyelonephritis, on the other hand, commonly they can present with these lower cystitis symptoms, but commonly will present with a fever. It's important to note here that this is a big distinction, distinction between cystitis and pyelonephritis as patients with localized urinary tract infection typically do not, if ever, present with a fever since this is localized to the bladder. But patients with pyel pyelonephritis can also present with flank pain and CVA tenderness as well. So some symptom, or some patient populations may not be as cut and dry as the symptoms that I have listed here. And some of those may be patients with a catheter associated UTI or patients with a spinal cord injury. So while patients with a catheter can present with those typical symptoms that we think of, they may also have acute hematuria, which is blood in the urine and pelvic discomfort as well. And the patients that we tend to have the most difficult time diagnosing with a true UTI is gonna be our spinal cord injury patients. And this is because they often cannot report any acute urinary symptoms. And so these patients can have increased spasticity, for example, or sometimes just a sense of unease, but it's important to take these symptoms into consideration along with systemic signs and symptoms such as you know, an elevated white blood cell count and fever as well. So in order to make a true diagnosis of UTI, we have to have three elements present. And so these include the urinary symptoms that I just spoke about, pyuria or white blood cells in the urine. One exception to this could be patients that are neutropenic as they may not be able to mount a strong immune response um, in the setting of a UTI. And finally, we have to have a positive urine culture. So that brings us to our first self-assessment question. Which of the following meets the criteria for the diagnosis of asymptomatic bacteria? A is a 64-year-old female with two consecutive urine cultures growing 100,000 colony forming units of Klebsiella pneumoniae who presents with acute, without, who denies acute <laughs> urinary symptoms. B, a 32-year-old female with new onset of dysuria and urinary frequency, and she's growing 100,000 colony forming units of E. coli in the urine. C is a 28-year-old male with a chronic Foley catheter and a urine culture with 100 colony forming units of gram-negative rod. D is A and C, and E is all of the above. Any guesses? Correct. So both of the patients in A and C did not have any acute urinary symptoms, yet they did have a positive urine culture that represented true bacteria. So now that we've differentiated between ASB and UTI, we're now going to move into our urinalysis. We're going to talk about the importance of appropriate ordering in addition to the different components of a urinalysis that we are interested in when we're discussing ASB. So generally speaking, we can look at the urine in two different ways. We have our gross examination, and this will include things such as color, clarity, odor, so things that we can see and smell. And then we'll have our chemical examination, which will rely on our UA dipstick test. And these will include leukocyte esterase and nitrites, particularly what we'll be talking about in this presentation, but definitely some other things such as pH, albumin, and glucose as well may be clinically significant for other disease states. So let's talk about the gross examination first. So ID Mythbuster number one, color does not tell. So urine discoloration can be caused for a lot of different reasons. For example, 
Dark urine is usually seen in patients with inadequate um, fluid intake or dehydration, and medications can sometimes turn the color orange in the case of rifampin or even green. Certain, vitam certain vitamins as well can also turn our urine a bright yellow color, uh, particularly B, B vitamins, um, but it's important to note that an isolated change in urine, uh, such as dark or cloudy urine, in the absence of signs and symptoms of a UTI, um, should not trigger a UA to be ordered. Additionally, smell does not tell either. So a strong urine smell is thought to be secondary to ammonia production. There are many reasons for odorous urine, including many non-infectious causes, such as food. We think of asparagus being the, the one that comes to mind for me, at least. Vitamins, um, and then medical conditions such as uncontrolled diabetes as well. Therefore, urine odor should not be used as a reason to send a urine culture in patients without any symptoms. Studies have actually looked at this and have found that, um, have investigated whether certain urine smells correlate with a UTI. And what they have found is that providers oftentimes uh, will send a urine culture based on smell and end up dislabeling patients with a urinary tract infection. Whereas sometimes they may even miss a true UTI in the case where the urine may not be odorous. So now we'll move into our microscopic examination of the urine. First, I wanna talk about leukocyte esterase and nitrites. So essentially leukocyte esterase indicates inflammation of the urinary tract. Um, it's a biomarker for pyuria essentially. And so as we know, a lot of things can cause inflammation, not just um, infection. And so here I have listed things such as, you know, irritation, for example, in patients that have chronic catheters, um, glomerulonephritis, UTI, and then sexually transmitted infections as well can cause this. This is not an all um, encompassing list, but definitely just some that I think about. And so overall, this has a pretty poor, um, a good negative predictive value, but very poor positive predictive value. So it should never be used to rule in a UTI. Nitrites on the other hand, what we're looking at here is that some gram negative bacteria have the ability to convert nitrate to nitrites. However, not all gram negatives have the ability to do this nor gram positive. So this really has poor specificity and selectivity for a UTI. Um, as we can misdiagnose patients with a UTI when this is positive, and that's what I commonly see in my practice, but we could also miss a UTI if we're um, looking solely at nitrites. So overall, neither of these markers are reliable for diagnosing a UTI, and we should always pay, be taking the patient's symptoms um, into account. Some other factors that we look at for on our urinalysis is going to be hematuria. As I mentioned earlier, this, this just represents the presence of blood in the urine. But again, this is not sensitive for a UTI. Epithelial cells are important because when we see UAs with high numbers of epithelial cells, this can represent skin contamination. And if we are uh, thinking that the patient has a UTI, then that sample should be recollected. Um, but I don't recommend that if the patient is not having any symptoms. So this represents a poorly collected sample. And finally, what we're going to talk about the most is pyuria. So as I stated, it represents inflammation in the urinary tract. Um, but keep in mind that the while the absence of pyuria may roll out a UTI, uh, the presence of pyuria is extremely common in our patients. And so as you can see here, I have listed um, different patient populations that we commonly see in practice, along with their relatively relative pre prevalence of pyuria. So you can see similarly to um, bacteria, patients with diabetes, our patients that reside in long-term care facilities, dialysis patients, and then patients with chronic catheters are oftentimes have high levels of pyuria detected. But there's a lot of non-infectious causes for this. Um, again, this is not 
a full list of things that can cause this, but some that come to mind. So a recent urologic procedure, um, NSAIDs such as ibuprofen, PPIs, malignancy, urinary tract stones, and then interstitial nephritis may cause this. So if you take anything away from this presentation, just think that pyuria alone in the absence of symptoms is not a surrogate marker for a UTI and should not be used to as an indication to, in, uh, to start antimicrobial therapy. So some studies have actually looked at this and how common it actually is. So this was a study that was published um, last year in clinical infectious diseases. And I'll orient you to this because I know it's a little confusing when you first look at it, but essentially they followed uh, women over a course of a hundred days and they had them do daily UA dipstick test. And so they monitored their levels of leukocyte esterase, which you will see on the red line and dots, and then also levels of bacteria that's represented on the blue line. The black dots represent when a UTI was treated, and then the black diamonds represent when they were complaining of urinary symptoms. And so as you can see, you can see high levels of pyuria even in the absence of symptoms and when a UTI wasn't treated. So I thought this was really neat as it shows just how common pyuria can be and really how benign it is and may rarely cause symptoms. Additionally, you can also see high levels of bacteria as well in the absence of symptoms. So I really liked this study and I thought they did a good job of showing just how common this is in practice and that it's definitely not an indication to start antimicrobial therapy. So what are our indications for urinalysis? Let's talk about this for a bit. So generally speaking, um, there's very few reasons to order a urinalysis. And when I talk about this, I'm speaking specifically for an infectious cause. So we can order non-ID UAs for a lot of reasons, but I'm talking about an ID UA specifically. But some indications are patients, of course, that have acute urinary symptoms. Pregnancy is another example in which a urinalysis can be ordered for screening and treatment of ASB. We can also screen prior to transurethral resection of the prostate, in addition to any urological procedure in which mucosal bleeding is anticipated. But commonly in my practice, um, this is one of my projects for the year, and so I'm looking at urinalysis every day, and I commonly see that a UA is ordered inappropriately in the vast majority of patients. And so when should we avoid UA ordering? I previously mentioned in cases of malodorous urine, cloudy urine, changes of urine, as these are not indicate, these do not indicate a UTI on their own. We also want to avoid screening for UAs in patients undergoing a non-urological procedure. And then we want to avoid pan culturing in hemodynamically stable patients with a fever. And this is because if the patient cannot tell you that they are having urinary symptoms such as acute cystitis, it's very unlikely that if they are not having these symptoms that um, a, a UTI is what is in fact causing their fever. Additionally, we want to avoid repeat urine cultures to document clearance, as we know the urine is not sterile. And then we want to avoid upon routine catheter insertion or removal. So some studies have looked at the misuse of urinalysis and how prevalent it is. And what this study looked at was the level of pyuria, um, how the level of pyuria directly predicts the probability of antimicrobials prescribing. So these were all in asymptomatic patients. And as you can see, the different columns represent various levels of pyuria. If you look at the purple column, which represents high levels, you can see the antibiotics were prescribed in 30 to 40% of these patients. So this represents a big area of improvement in practice to ensure that for one, making sure that we are ordering the UA appropriately in the first place so that we can avoid further antimicrobial treatment. Another study looked at patients across 46 hospitals with asymptomatic bacteria, and 
the percent of those patients in which antibiotics were given. And this was a astounding uh, figure for me. As you can see that at the majority of these hospitals, ASB was treated in 80 to 100 percent of the time. So this is a really big deal. Uh, and it's not just prevalent here at Erlanger, it's prevalent everywhere across the world. Prevalent enough to where the New York Times posted an article to um, an RX for doctors to stop with the urine test. So this has really been a call to action and something that if we can steward urinalysis really well and prevent treatment of ASB, then we can improve patient outcomes. So we looked at this at Erlanger last year. We did a laboratory use evaluation of urinalysis that were ordered between July 1st of 2020 and June 30th of last year. And so we found that a total of over 28,000 urinalyses has been ordered. And as you can see, the majority of these were ordered in the emergency department, which is not surprising. And then um, a close second was our OBGYN, which wasn't surprising to me either since we commonly screen and treat for ASB in these patients. And then the third most common being our hospitalist service. We took a random sample of 100 patients of all of these UAs that had been ordered, and we found that the UA was only ordered appropriately in 15% of these patients and antibiotics were administered 34% of the time. So as you can see, this is a pretty significant area of improvement here as well. We looked at the chief complaint of these patients in which a, a UA was ordered and found that the majority of the time patients presented with gastrointestinal pain, altered mental status, and um, genital related pain. Um, so we'll talk more about altered mental status in the setting of asymptomatic bacteria here in a bit, but I thought this was relevant to show. When we did a cost analysis of this, what we found is that while the year analysis it, itself is relatively inexpensive, since this is misused so often, this can lead to pretty significant healthcare costs. So if we had ordered year analysis appropriately during this time, there would have been a potential cost savings of about $90,000. And um, that includes the reflex to culture as well. So that brings us to our next self-assessment question. Which of the following is the most accurate statement regarding urinalysis results? A, pyuria represents inflammation and has a high positive predictive value for the diagnosis of UTI. B, the presence of turbid or malodorous urine likely indicates that the patient has a UTI. C, the urinalysis findings may aid in the diagnosis of UTI only in patients with urinary signs and symptoms. Or D, there is no association between degrees of pyuria and probability of antimicrobial initiation. Yes, so the answer is C. So the main thing that you should take away from this component of the lecture is that while the urinalysis can aid in the diagnosis of UTI, we want to make sure that we are only ordering them in patients that truly have an indication and that they should not be used alone to diagnose a UTI without signs and symptoms. So now we're going to move into some of the guideline recommendations by the IDSA for the management of asymptomatic bacteria. So the general theme of these guidelines goes back to the fact that the treatment of ASB is not helpful. So there is no role for routine screening or treating in our general population. And this is because the treatment does not reduce frequency of symptomatic infection. And commonly, we will find that we can actually increase our patient's risk for developing subse subsequent uh, symptomatic infection after being treated with ASB. And it can also be associated with antibiotic adverse events. So the treatment of ASB has actually been recognized as an antibiotic never event. And this globally recognizes and defines the most inappropriate use of antibiotics. 
And so we know that inappropriate antibiotic use is associated with increased antimicrobial resistance and further adverse effects that can lead to preventable patient harm. So first we'll move into our non-pregnant females. So the guidelines recommend against treating for ASV in these patients. So let's talk about some of the literature of why this is. So what I'm showing here is a figure from a prospective cohort study that was conducted in 94 women. They, and this was done in 1969. As you can tell, the figure looks a bit dated. Um, but these patients were given either macrobid or placebo, and they were followed over a course of a year. And what they found is that only 55% of patients who were treated for ASB remained, quote unquote, cured after one year. But in retrospect, we know that the urine is not sterile. Um, so that's not a surprising finding to me. Additionally, the patients that were treated for ASB had higher rates of reinfection and relapse compared to the non-treated group. So this was the first study that really showed that there may be a protective role of bacteria in the absence of um, UTI symptoms. Let's time travel a little bit to 2012. There was a study that was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases that looked at premenopausal women um, with recurrent tra urinary tract infections. And so they separated these patients into group A, which were not treated um, with antibiotics for asymptomatic bacteria, and patients in group B that were treated anytime that they had a positive urine culture. And as you can see, at 12 months, the patients that were treated for ASB had significantly higher rates of symptomatic infection. So again, uh, this just shows again that when we treat these patients with antibiotics, we're increasing their risk of further symptomatic infection. Additionally, this study looked at the percentage of patients that were recurrence-free for UTIs over a 12-month period. And again, non-surprisingly, they found that the group that was not treated with antibiotics had lower rates of recurrence, which is represented by the black line. These same researchers came back a few years later and wanted to see um, how the treatment of ASB was associated with higher prevalence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so what they found is that the patients that were treated with antibiotics had higher rates of and of antimicrobial resistant strains of E. coli, particularly resist resistance to Augmentin, Bactrim, and Ciprofloxacin. And I thought it was also interesting, they looked at the rates of pyelonephritis between groups and found that there was no statistically significant difference. And so this kind of helps show providers that when we withhold therapy in these patients, we're not increasing their risk of developing um, more significant infection. On the other hand, we've talked about how we could potentially harm patients and how the treatment of ASB is not generally helpful. This is just another study, a study that shows um, that we can cause patient harm when we treat patients for ASB. And so this was a study that looked at risk factors and outcomes that were associated with the treatment of ASB in hospitalized patients. And what they found is that when patients received antibiotics for ASB, they had longer durations of hospitalization. Um, the difference was four days in the antibiotic group versus three days, which you may think, okay, one day of hospitalization, that's not clinically significant, right? Well, we know with how strained we are in the hospital with uh, staffing shortages, and we know patients do better when they're at home. So to me, this was clinically significant. And I know if I'm a patient, I want to be out of the hospital as soon as possible. So, and in this case, we're keeping patients here unnecessarily for treatment. A Cochrane review looked at antibiotics versus placebo or no treatment for patients with ASB as well. And what they found is that there was no difference in bacterial cure in patients that got antibiotics or placebo. However, patients that got antibiotics um, more, were more likely to develop adverse effects related to antibiotic use compared to um, the group that did not receive treatment. 
So again, I feel like we have some high level evidence that really shows that when we treat ASV, we're potentially uh, presenting our patients with more risk for harm. So we know that inappropriate antibiotic use and just antibiotic use in general can increase our patient's risk of going on to develop C. diff infection. There was a study that looked at this specifically in asymptomatic bacteria. And what they found is that 5.6% of patients who received antibiotics for ASB went on to develop C. diff compared to 2% in patients that did not receive antibiotics. And the patients that developed C. diff were at an increased risk of death compared to the group that did not receive therapy. And again, this is not surprising as we know that C. diff infection poses significant, not only significant mortality, but also high morbidity in our patients. And when patients do develop C. diff infection, they then are at higher rates of having recurrent C. diff infections later on. So next, we're going to dig into our cognitively impaired patients and our elderly patients. Most commonly in practice, this is an area where I know that we struggle a lot with an accurate diagnosis of UTI, and these patients are at a high risk of being treated with antibiotics. And so the IDSA guidelines recommend assessment of other causes and careful observation rather than initiating empiric therapy in these patients. So as I stated, these patients can be rather challenging uh, for diagnosing a UTI as they often cannot, are not able to report that they are having acute urinary symptoms. And so naturally in practice, we tend to rely heavily on UA findings. Um, and then this in turn is associated with increased risk of antibiotic related adverse effects. So when looking at the literature here, what you will find is that bacteria and delirium are independently common in, in the elderly, but there has been no causal relationship found. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that delirium falls or confusions um, are symptoms of a UTI in the absence of acute urinary symptoms. And we should only initiate therapy um, in this setting if the patient has systemic signs and symptoms such as fever or an elevated white blood cell count as often these patients tend to have higher risk of going on to develop an antibiotic related adverse event. There was a study that looked at patients residing in long-term care facilities um, that had persistent bacteria. And so they looked at several characteristics of this patient population. And as you, as you can see at the bottom of this table, that patients with uh, bacteria in these long-term care facilities had higher rates of antibiotic utilization. In addition, they also had higher rates of multidrug resistant gram negative rod uh, urinary isolates as well. Um, however, there was no change in their mental status and there was also no change in hospitalizations as well. So it seems like we're not improving patients' mental status when we treat for bacteria, but we're increasing their risk of multidrug resistant bacteria and antibiotic utilization. Another study, this was a prospective cohort study that looked at 110 nursing home residents with advanced dementia and suspected UTI. The majority of patients, 75% of patients were treated with antibiotics. Um, and they looked at these patients based on whether they received antibiotics, whether those were given orally, um, intramuscularly, or in the hospital setting. And so as you can see, um, the solid line here represents patients that did not receive antimicrobial therapy. And these patients had higher probability of survival compared to patients that received IV antibiotics in the hospital. So that brings us to our next self-assessment question. Sorry, I think my slides are frozen. 
PowerPoint is not responding. Should restart the program. Oh, please. There. Okay. So now let's move into our next self-assessment question. So this is a patient case. We have an 80-year-old man with moderate dementia and benign prostate hyperplasia who presented to the emergency department from his long-term care facility because of lethargy. He's mildly confused, but is able to participate in a review of symptoms. He denies cough, fever, abdominal pain, and dysuria. The patient has BPH, but reports no change in urinary frequency or urgency compared to his baseline. His vitals are stable and within normal limits. All of his labs are normal except for an elevated BUN and a serum creatinine that is above his baseline. So which of the following is best to recommend regarding obtaining a urinalysis and urine culture in this patient? A, the confusion may be attributable um, to a UTI and he may just be able to report, be unable to report urinary symptoms secondary to his confusion. So we should order a UA. B, this is an easy diagnostic test to obtain and more information is better. C, no, the patient has no complaints of a UTI and other symptoms for confusion should be explored. Or D, he lives in a long-term care facility and therefore is at a high risk of multi-drug resistant infections that should be treated. I think I heard C out there. Yes, that's correct. So finally, let's briefly talk about when the treatment of ASB or the screening of ASB is warranted. The guidelines um, have very few patients in which they do make a recommendation for this. And this includes pregnant women, patients that are undergoing an endourological procedure in which mucosal bleeding is anticipated, and then renal transplant within one month, but there is some nuances with this recommendation and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. So first let's talk about in pregnancy. So some older studies looked at this and what they found is that patients that were pregnant and also had bacteria were associated with higher rates of the development of pyelonephritis. Additionally, there were concerns that there was an increased risk of preterm birth and increased risk of low birth weights, less than um, 2,500 grams. And so for that reason, uh, the guidelines do recommend screening and treating in these patients. However, you will, you will find, we won't talk about it as much, but there is some newer data supporting that maybe the risk of pyelonephritis is not as high in these patients as we once thought. Um, as far as endological procedures, um, this is just based off the fact that any patient that's undergoing a procedure can have a risk of a post-operative infection. And this holds true for endourological procedures. However, they recommend short courses, similarly to how we would treat any other um, patient about to undergo a surgery. So with perioperative antibiotics compared to prolonged uh, antimicrobial therapy, if they're not having symptoms. As far as our renal transplant patients, um, the IDSA recommends that um, in patients that have had a renal transplant surgery greater than one month, they don't recommend treating. And we'll talk about why that is. However, there is not sufficient evidence to make a recommendation of treating ASB within the first month. And so commonly we, we will see that this is done in practice and there's just not a lot of evidence to um, 
to support or not support that recommendation. So we'll talk about renal transplant patients real quick. This was a more recent study that was published after the guidelines. Uh, this one was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases in 2021. And they looked at um, 199 kidney transplant patients with ASB. They were randomly assigned to receive antibiotics or no therapy. And what they found is that there was no significant difference in the occurrence of symptomatic UTI between the group that got antibiotics versus no therapy. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the line commonly crosses each other. So there is really no difference, but in the beginning, you can see there may be a benefit. So that's really uh, kind of coincides with the IDSA guidelines. So in summary, um, if you take anything away from this presentation, I want you to think in mind that you should only order a UA in patients with acute urinary symptoms. I know that I probably repeated myself saying that several times and that was on purpose. Additionally, altered mental status alone in the absence of systemic signs and symptoms of infection is not an indication for empiric antibiotics. And it's really a low stakes uh, situation in which we would favor holding antimicrobial therapy and finding other causes for their altered mental status. And finally, in the vast majority of patients, given the few exceptions that we talked about, we don't wanna treat asymptomatic bacteria. As you can see, this has been associated with significant adverse effects related to antibiotic use. We're increasing our risk of multi-drug resistant bacteria in our urinary isolates. And when these patients do have a symptomatic UTI, this poses significant challenges in treating these patients at times. So we want to be judicious with our antimicrobial therapy, and this is no exception to that. So with that being said, I will open it up to any questions that you may have. Yes, Brittany. How would you want to discuss with your clinicians about they um, urinary symptoms or uh, ways to from our patients to really tease out the types of vague uh, symptoms that might not be especially described as dysuria, but that might be Yeah, so the question was, if I heard it correctly, is how would you assess a patient who is presenting with more vague symptoms in which could possibly be attributable to a UTI, but could certainly have other causes as well? Uh, for example, a patient with maybe some suprapubic tenderness or abdominal pain. Um, and I think the main thing that I would probably want to know is in regards to the timing, um, particularly, you know, is this a new onset of this? Um, I would also want to look at, you know, any systemic signs and symptoms of infection. If they had an elevated white blood cell count, we could also look at imaging to see if that could help us as well, such as a CT abdomen, pelvis, to look for any hydronephrosis or um, addition to like bladder wall thickening as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> I guess I know sometimes it is difficult, but I think it, the main thing that is important to remember in these patients is that if they're not having systemic signs or symptoms, oftentimes it is best to um, 
maybe delay therapy and really try to nail down what is going on before starting antibiotics. Oh, and what everybody was wanting, I have the CE code. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming. I was like, do I wear a foundation? Because otherwise you'll see me blushing. It's <laughs> like, just pack on the foundation. Well, luckily we couldn't see you over the back. <laughs> Next time, no, did. Next time, I'm called, I used to be called Twinkle Fence because I. Let me stand right here, let me stand right here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>